hundred years ago, women took to the streets of London demonstrating and wrecking property all over the city. The suffragettes are the only protest movement in the history of Great Britain that are actually succeeded by violence. For the BBC's History of the World season, I'm going to explore these events through objects from their daring campaign. Several hundreds of women would have rampaged down the West End, smashing all these windows. Through the relatives of women who made enormous personal sacrifices for the cause. This tube was pushed down the mouth, through the throat, and then this was poured down straight into the throat. <sighs> and the places that still resonate with their presence. As they pulled her away, the spur became broken. So this is a symbol of the public campaign for women to get the vote. Who were these women who became known as the suffragettes? In this programme, we're going to trace the story of their activity in London and try and find out more about this extraordinary political upheaval that helped to transform women's lives and our democracy. I've lived most of my life in London, and I've always been passionate about women's rights. I want to discover what this city, its people and parliament can reveal about an incredible moment of history. A hundred years ago, London was still a very traditional society, but it was also becoming the stage for some remarkable scenes. A group of determined women were taking London by storm. Hyde Park was the setting for a major spectacle created to stun Edwardian society. They organised the most incredible occasion called Women's Sunday. And they brought women from all over the country on specially chartered trains to this monster rally in Hyde Park. They had 20 platforms with about half a dozen speakers talking about what a good idea it would be for women to have the vote. And it was a, a defining moment, really, in the suffragette campaign in London. Refined women were not supposed to demonstrate in public spaces. But Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters Christabel and Sylvia thought differently. Their movement, the Women's Social and Political Union, wanted to stir up a 30-year-old quest for women's suffrage. They wanted to do something. They wanted to make small actions, um, a, a tra transform public opinion and to influence Parliament through deeds and not words. On Women's Sunday, they also launched something very important, which was their colour scheme. And their colour scheme was purple, white and green, purple for dignity, white for purity, and green for fertility and hope for the future. The colours were used on their new uniform, presented for the first time in Hyde Park, complete with military sash. They deliberately went out to make a spectacle of themselves, and it's a brilliant idea of marketing and merchandising, and it really took off. I've come to the Museum of London, whose collection of memorabilia helps bring this story to life. Hello, to the Beverly Cook London. is a curator like here. Me? Lovely, isn't it? This is presumably one of the sashes, isn't Yes, it? the regalia that was introduced in 1908, yep. yes, of course. And uh, in the Votes for Women magazine, which was the weekly suffragette uh, newspaper, um, the women were always encouraged to wear their sashes in public. Women wanted to be seen wearing purple, white and green. And that says quite a lot about those women, because you had to be brave to be walking around in that colour scheme. Even a little bit of it drew attention to the fact that you were a suffragette. 
What, what is this? This is a motoring scarf, actually. A and motoring scarf. scarf? And motoring scarves were, of course, very popular at the time anyway. So they were just sort of literally adapting something that was popular to sort of help promote and enhance and market the campaign a bit further. So they knew that these would sell. What about... Uh, the working class women that supported the cause, what would they have won? They would have been able to afford button badges. Some of these button badges were very cheap. That one shows a design by Sylvia Pankhurst. Oh, really? And she gave the campaign much of its visual imagery, its logos, symbols, That's and lovely. that became one of the sort of most um, iconic visions of what the... What about this? That shows um, Emmeline Pankhurst. It was a celluloid uh, portrait button badge. They were mass produced, so it would have been sold very cheaply, possibly for a penny. So very affordable by everyone. Women of all different classes joined the campaign. The women who were active in the suffrage movement were white collar workers. They were factory workers, writers, teachers, actresses, the first generations of women educated in universities, and young radicals. By 1908, the Pankhurst's followers had already earned themselves a nickname. The Daily Mail um, invented the term suffragette uh, with the idea that it was diminutive. It was patronizing, it was sort of like ladette. But like many other things in history, what was originally a term of abuse became a term that they embraced. Mill worker Annie Kenny joined the Pankhurst and became a leading suffragette. Her great niece, Anne O'Shaughnessy, and her daughter, Stephanie, cherish Annie's commitment to the cause. Here's a lovely one of Annie. Oh, yes, that's beautiful. That's a really beautiful one yeah. of her. Yeah. My great aunt came from a big family in the north of England. They were working class people. Certainly, that generation, the great aunts, were definitely expected that their job would be to be married and stay in the home. In the early Edwardian era, the male aristocracy still assumed a natural entitlement to power. Only 60% of men, those who owned property, could vote in general elections. Criminals, the poor, the insane and women could not. Many people, including women, felt it was unfeminine and unnatural to even want to do so. This series of postcards here just show how the suffragettes were being portrayed in the popular press, oh, really? very unsympathetically, yeah. typical anti-suffrage. Now, what's this one? These are meant to represent two um, suffragettes here, and again, fairly typical representations. This one here is wearing a pork pie hat and mm -hmm. the pork pie hat at the Edwardian period was associated with lesbianism. Oh really? Yes. A hundred years ago men did believe themselves to be a superior sex. There's no doubt at all that there was a very great force within every class of society which said women were some way different. It was thought that there must be part of life which should be uncontaminated by the scramble and rough and tumble of parliamentary politics. There was a fear that if women got the vote in Britain, that they'd stop getting married, stop having children, and the British race would just die out. But society was changing. Women could now go to university and were starting to demand a voice in this exciting new society. The Pankhurst aimed to build mass support so politicians would be forced to take notice. Their magazine, Votes for Women, was sold on street corners, and over 20 WSPU shops in London sold their branded goods. Followers lobbied cabinet ministers of the Liberal government, elected in 1906, including Herbert Asquith, who would soon become Prime Minister. To Asquith, the women were just irritants, but the Pankers found creative ways to keep up the pressure. The Pankersquith board game was produced uh, specifically to promote the campaign. Suffragettes were really good at producing material like this that uh, tapped into sort of the Edwardian ideas of what was already popular. The counters were actually little uh, lead figures of suffragettes. <laughs> 
And the idea of the game was to move a suffragette from her home and eventually she ends up in uh, the House of Commons. Oh. So it's like a spiral game. But obviously along the way she meets quite a few obstacles, um, like Inspector Jarvis, for example, who would obviously stop her progress and members of the government. In Westminster, none of these tactics were cutting any ice and Prime Minister Asquith refused all the Pankhurst requests to meet. There was never any question of the Liberals caving in to the demands of the Pankhurst, which was to give women votes on the same terms as they were given to men. Because to do that, to give votes to women who were property owners, was to reinforce the Conservative vote. In the face of this resistance, suffragettes repeatedly targeted the nerve centre of British power. The suffragettes' motto was deeds, not words, and one of the actions that they took to grab attention was to chain themselves to the railings here at number 10 Downing Street. It was the first time that anybody had done anything like that, and it became a sort of iconic image for the whole campaign. So they used to use those belts um, to chain themselves to railings. Right. And they were actually adapted from belts that were previously used in lunatic asylums. I cannot get over the tininess of all of these them, women. Yeah. And one of the reasons that they liked wearing those suffragettes was because um, they knew that the only way that the police could really release them was by manhandling them and um, going under their clothing. And of course that was something that uh, the police were very reluctant to do. Some activists became more aggressive in their protests. I suppose they saw themselves as thinking that, you know, the suffrage had never been won without a fight. There'd always been militancy and women just had to go the whole hog and push the issue. This here is a toffee hammer and toffee hammers were traditionally used by suffragettes for window smashing. They were very keen to attack property from that period because they felt that would be a way of um, getting the public, businesses and the government to sit up and take notice. And toffee hammers were particularly used because they were very light and they were very easy to conceal. Emily Wilding Davison took to militant action with gusto. She had a degree in English and had worked as a governess for a Liberal MP. She was quite an extremist. She invented a whole new type of protest, which was creating um, letter bombs, putting them into pillar boxes. So she pioneered that strategy and was responsible for destroying um, hundreds of letters and bits of post. The best place to cause a disturbance was at Parliament. The House of Commons for the suffragettes was a sacred place. It was always known as the Mother of Parliaments, the Queen of Parliaments. For them, it was a very important uh, focus of their thinking and their activities. I've come to meet parliamentary legend and former Labour MP, Tony Benn, who's passionate about the history of our democracy and has taken a personal interest in suffragette actions inside this formidable seat of power. Now, this is the oldest part of the building, in a way. All the great debates occurred here. The House of Commons sat here until 1834, when there was a huge fire. Now, apparently there's some significance in this particular statue. Yes, well, what right? happened here was, in April 1909, a woman came with three other people, and she had a handcuff, and one uh, part was uh, attached to herself and locked, and the other part she put on the spur, and as they pulled her away, the spur became broken. So this is a symbol of the public campaign for women to get the vote. And also, I see that Falkland's sword was broken. Oh, gosh. So uh, somebody had handcuffed themselves to the sword. And women were not allowed beyond this point. This moves into the central lobby where people lobby their MPs. What about that statue over there? Is now, here, right? this statue of Russell, Emmeline Pankhurst, came and demanded uh, the vote and shouted and jumped, I think, on the, on the chair and, and moved here. And it was one of the reasons why women were kept out, because they were not prepared to have demonstrations. So that must have caused a bit of a stir in here. By 1910, things had reached boiling point. 
Despite years of lobbying parliament, the WSPU were still being stonewalled. On November the 18th, a mass protest in Parliament Square degenerated into an event which became known as Black Friday. The square behind me was a scene of unprecedented and terrible violence. The police had been instructed to intimidate the women so that they would be afraid to ever come here again. There were running battles with the police. 150 women were physically and in some cases sexually assaulted by the police on that day. And it was a very shocking event indeed. In what became a riot, over 100 arrests were made. All suffragettes, for their first offence, were offered the possibility of paying a fine, but they would never do that. They never paid a fine. They always insisted on going to prison because that generated a great deal more publicity, and that was exactly what they wanted. Women arrested in London were taken to Holloway Prison. Behind these walls, there were chilling consequences for the suffragettes' actions. These griffins are all that's left of the original building. The women would have gone past these through a gateway into a far more intimidating place. For the head of security escorting me, there's little trace or memory of what occurred here a hundred years ago. So these windows around here, what are they? That's all, that's all the cell windows. In the association rooms. It's because in the suffragettes' days, the in the old building, the cells overlooked the exercise yard. Yeah. And there's a, a lovely story of Thomas Beecham, the, comp the conductor, coming to see Ethel Smythe, mm. who had written an anthem for the women called Women on the March, mm. I think it was called. <laughs> and he saw her conducting frantically with a toothbrush outside, and the women were walking around singing this anthem. Must have been a sight for sore eyes. Yeah. I don't know what the other prisoners made of it, mind you. <laughs> Annie Kenny was repeatedly arrested and sent to Holloway. This is an extract from Annie Kenny's book, Memoirs of a Militant, and this is about her first night in Holloway prison. After climbing what looked like Jacob's Ladder, we reached a cell. When I was safely inside, the doors were shut with a bang. I had many tips given me by old hands, and when I became an old hand, I passed the tips on to others. Never before had British prisons locked up so many women for a political cause. Over a thousand suffragettes were detained over the five years of the campaign. The collection that we have here at the museum was gathered together by women who had served terms of imprisonment. And because they were often split into different wings, one of the ways they found to communicate with each other was by writing illicitly on prison toilet paper. But, but when did they pass it to one another? There is some thought that uh, sympathetic wardens oh, really? would pass it between different wings. And going, these look as though they're going to a party. Incredibly <laughs> elegant. <laughs> yes. The suffragettes demanded the status of political prisoners, and when they didn't get it, they went on hunger strike. The government's response was force feeding. Hunger strike and force feeding is a really um, defining moment in the story of the suffragette struggle. There we go. I'm meeting the granddaughter of Violet Dowdney, an Oxford graduate who became a militant suffragette. So. What did she do? What were her activities? Violet um, wrapped a, a metal weight with labels about votes for women and threw it through Reginald McKenna, the then Home Secretary's resident, his dining room window, <laughs> and was sentenced to two months hard labour. Many women, like Violet, were force-fed. First, they were strapped into a chair to prevent them from struggling. Once the mouth was forced open, this tube was pushed down the mouth, through the throat, as far down as they possibly could get it. And then this jug of Dear various different God. liquids, brandy and milk was one, raw eggs was another, was poured down straight into this. So obviously this took quite a few people to, to do this. 
and that's what my grandmother went through yeah. so that people like me could have the vote. The Pankhurst always expressed gratitude for this commitment to the struggle by issuing a personal certificate of thanks. This is it. This oh is goodness. the very thing. As you can see, it's got Violet's name written in by Sylvia and then signed by Ameline. Oh, my right. goodness, that's a wonderful thing to have. It absolutely is, absolutely wonderful. The strategy of force feeding proved to be a catastrophe for the government. Society was deeply shocked by force feeding, but strangely enough, wasn't as shocked by that as it was by what came to be called the Cat and Mouse Act. The Cat and Mouse Act the treaty was to allow the prison authorities to let women out rather than forcibly feed them, and then re-arrested them when they went on hunger strike again and hunger strike in prison, let out, recover, re-arrested, back in prison again. The horrors of force feeding became a rallying point for the suffragette movement. After she was force-fed, Emily Davison became more fanatical. One of her moments of glory took place on the night of the 1911 census, deep in the bowels of the Houses of Parliament. This is a little broom cupboard, or it was, where people kept the brushes and brooms, and a very imaginative suffragette called Emily Wilding Davison got into the House of Commons, somehow got down here and hid in there. And when they said to her, what was your address on the night of the House of the Census, she said the House of Commons. I told the story in the House of Commons and then I said, I'm going to put up a plaque to Emily Wilding Davison. And I didn't ask permission because I'm too old to ask permission. <laughs> I simply had it made and I got a photograph of her. And I came down with an electric drill and I put it up on the wall and they've, nobody has dared remove it. It's quite interesting. And that is lovingly polished by the cleaners and uh, it, it's much appreciated. It's wonderful. I appreciate it, Tony. That's a wonderful oh, gesture. <laughs> Between 1910 and 1912, the government could no longer ignore the movement and the House discussed a series of conciliation bills to give votes to women. The idea was gaining ground among Liberal MPs, but each time failed to get full cabinet support. That's when nerves really harden. And once you get to 1912, the third failure of the bill, it is all out war. There's, there's no going back. An army of women smashed the windows of shops all over the West End. Suffragettes firebombed politicians' houses and even set churches alight. Women caught for such deeds were considered a threat to national security. The museum holds some unusual photos of convicted suffragettes. They were the first surveillance images, actually, that were um, commissioned by the government. When the women were arrested, they often refused to have their photograph taken as like a mugshot. Mm. So in the end, um, the government decided to ask a photographer to develop a long-range lens. And he was positioned in a van, an unmarked van, in the yard of Holloway Jail. And the reason they felt this was so important was because a lot of the women were undertaking attacks of works of art going into museums yeah. and so if any security guards saw people who looked like these women trying to enter they would sort of bar their way do we know who these women are yeah this one i love because it's got a big red cross against it and on the reverse it says the woman who slashed the rope be venus as oh if she was goodness. the most dangerous woman suffragette please do never ever let her enter your premises oh. and her name was mary richardson oh good I don't blame the suffragettes for behaving as they did. The suffragettes' violence, not just physical violence, not just breaking the shop windows in Regent Street and Oxford Street, but there's an intellectual violence as well. Now, these were all God-fearing, nice ladies whose heads had been turned by suffrage, who had become completely politicised by this extraordinary campaign. But the most extreme suffragette protest was yet to come. On June the 4th, 1913, Emily Davison arrived at the Epsom Derby intent on making a dramatic public protest. 
This is a horse racing time. The king is a great horse racing man. So anything that disrupts a horse race is going to make front page news in newspapers. As the king's horse approached, Davison broke out from the railings and entered its path. There will be very many people who argue that she didn't expect to die, she expected to cause a disturbance. My personal feeling is it was not a mistake, it was not an accident. She'd certainly been building up to something like that for quite some time. The Pankhursts organised a funeral fit to commemorate the life of the first suffragette martyr. It was deeply, deeply moving and, of course, would have secured a lot of people who were wavering, um, you know, on the side of, of, of the suffragettes. 6,000 women marched solemnly to this church, St George's in Bloomsbury. As the coffin came out of the church, leading suffragettes formed the guard of honor and saluted as it went past. Thousands of supporters were gathered below to pay their respects. That funeral was a seminal moment for the campaign. In August 1914, the First World War interrupted the suffragettes' battle. It would completely change women's role in society. The genie was let out of the bottle. A million women were involved in producing munitions by the end of the war. They're doing the jobs that normally would be done by men. They step into men's shoes. After the war, at last, women over 30 won the vote, extended to all women in 1928. By this time, the Commons also had its first female MPs. So, was all the violence really necessary? This is the most difficult question, you know, was it militancy or was it the long, steady years of suffrage campaigning? And the answer must be both. I think that without the violence, there would not have been attention drawn to their cause. The suffragettes are the only protest movement in the history of Great Britain that are actually succeeded by violence. The struggle to win the vote has had a lasting impact on the descendants of suffragettes. How did you feel about it? Immensely proud. Great. Immensely proud, yeah. Great. Once you're 18, you can go along and you can vote, then every single time I have the, um, the power to vote, I do. Great. Even if I'm abroad, I make sure I've got a postal vote. It's yeah. just one of those fundamental things that just of I've done ever since. The kind of legacy of Annie Kenny has passed through the family. I think she gave us a kind of, I wouldn't say militant view of the world, but definitely a very feminist um, uh, view of the world, and I think that was definitely passed down through the female line. I am extremely proud that this is in the family, and it does make me angry when people, particularly women, can't be bothered voting, because there's still parts of the world where the women don't have the vote, and it was fought for, and people suffered to get this. Even in Britain, women still don't have full equality, but the objects and locations I've seen are a testimony to the bitter struggle that underpins our democracy. If you have an object which shows what the people and places of the UK have given the world, then you can add it to our digital...